we are starting with this first lecture to just give a sense of context to the play that you will be thinking about during the day today and then seeing this afternoon. Now, Aristophanes, the writer of this comedy, had an extraordinary life. His period of writing dates from around about, well, 427 BCE, his first surviving or part surviving plays, through to about 386 BCE. Now, if you put that in the context of what's going on in the Greek world in that point, that is a period of cataclysmic change. Starting in the era of Athens' empire, when Athens is at the top of its game, the Parthenon is shining, resplendent at the top of the Acropolis, through into the period of the ups and downs of the Peloponnesian War, Athens losing that war, losing its empire, the entire Greek world being thrown into a period of disarray, Athens' democracy, being extinguished and reignited, and Athens then having to find its way within that very new and bizarre world of the fourth century. He's writing through one of the most turbulent and I would say most interesting eras of Greek history. And all of his comedies as a result are a reflection of the constant changing moods, interests, worries, aspirations, and ideas of the Athenian people. So what this lecture's doing is going to put specifically the assembly women into the immediate context that would have been in people's heads when they came to watch the play in the early 4th century BCE. I want to put into your heads what those original audience members would have been would have had in theirs. Before we do that, though, let's just take a step back and just think about the place of comedy more generally within the Athenian world. We have a map here of Athens, and of course, our eyes are drawn today to the theater of Dionysus in the bottom right-hand corner, where we know so much of the drama took place. But comedy actually is a late arrival on this Athenian dramatic landscape. Tragedy, we know, was going in Athens as part of a great festival from probably the middle of the 6th century BCE. But comedy does not join that until about the 480s BCE, so well into the 5th century. And the, the comedy festival, an entirely separate festival from the Dionysia, where tragedy is the mainstay, this separate festival, the Lanaia, doesn't actually come into play until the 440s BCE. Now, the great Dionysia that definitely happened in the theater of Dionysus had three tragedians, each writing three tragedies, and on top of that, a satyr play, there were also five comedians presenting one play each. So there was some comedy at the Dionysia, and Aristophanes wrote for the Dionysia. The audience for the Dionysia, crucially, because it happened in March, which was good open sailing weather in the Mediterranean, the audience would have been much more than just Athenian citizens. It would have been a more international, we might call it, audience members of Athens' empire, as well as other visiting uh, people from around the Aegean world. The Lanaia, on the other hand, which we think began probably putting on plays actually in the Agora rather than in the theater of Dionysus, and only later transferred to taking place in the theater of Dionysus, was held in late January, February, about now. That's closed sailing season, and as a result, the audience would have been a much more Athenian-centric, Athenian-only audience. The, fe the festival of comedy, the Lanaia, was a place when Athens was talking to itself, 
not to a much wider audience, public audience, if you will, of both Athenians and outsiders. As a result, what you could get away with in comedy at the Lanaya, how much mick you could really take out of people who were members of the Athenian kind of political elite, was greatly increased. In fact, the whole point of comedy, particularly at the Lanaya, was to intensely rip the piss out of major political figures that would be sitting amongst you in the audience, having to sit there publicly in the light, the daylight of an outdoor theatre, and take it as they were completely mocked on stage. In fact, there's a word in ancient Greek, the komodumonoi, those who are made fun of in comedy. If your play went on at the Dionysia, that more international public festival, you perhaps were supposed to rein it in a little. In fact, Aristophanes is sued on one occasion by one of the major political figures of the time, Cleon, because of a play that went on at the Dionysia that it was argued was just too mocking, too cutting. It was Athens washing too much dirty linen in public. If we're going to do that, that happens at the Lanaya, not at the Dionysia. We have about 11 out of, we know Aristophanes wrote 40 or more comedies. So we just have a small excerpt of the kinds of plays that went on here in the theatre of Dionysus. Some at the Dionysia, mostly at the Lanaya. Now, by the time Aristophanes is writing The Assembly Women, he is well known. Right? He's been writing since 424, and The Assembly Women dates most likely to 391, 390 BCE. This is a well-known playwright. He's had big successes, first prizes in lots of the dramatic competitions, and he's brought women on stage regularly as a ruse to be able to exploit the particular issues he wants to think about. So we've already had plays like Lysistrata, right? the sex strike play. We've already had plays like Thesmophorify Zeusai, where men are getting dressed up as women to infiltrate female-only religious ceremonies. But actually, all of those plays and others that we've that you will no doubt be familiar with, like frogs or knights, are all written during the time of the turbulent Peloponnesian War. They're all written when Athens is fighting for its very survival, but still with a chance of surviving, keeping its empire, and getting back to the glory days of the mid-fifth century. Not so assembly women. In fact, it's worth knowing and remembering that after 405, which is when Aristophanes wrote Frogs, produced Frogs, we don't have another play from Aristophanes until Assembly Women in 391, 390. He actually goes quiet, at least to us today, through this intervening period. So we have Aristophanes writing during the period of the Peloponnesian War when there's all still to play for, ups and downs, but all still to play for. And then we come back to Aristophanes when it is absolutely decidedly a totally different world in 391 and 390. And that's that totally different world for Athens that I want to explore with you for the remainder of this talk. Athens lost the Peloponnesian War. It had its great city walls torn down. It had its fleet disbanded. Its empire was gone. It was, in fact, forced to now follow Sparta wherever Sparta chose to lead in terms of what we today would call foreign policy. Almost immediately, there is a dramatic political shift in Athens. 
the democracy votes itself out of existence and gives power instead to a group eventually called the 30 tyrants. Now, as that name suggests, they don't do a particularly good job. And just a year later, in 403 BCE, there is an armed uprising of the people of Athens to reinstate that democracy. So you might think, okay, business as usual. Bit of an interruption, bit of a kind of tyrannical period, bit of an uprising, bit of a rebellion, back to business as usual. But not in any way. Because the democracy that was reinstated in 403 was notably different in a number of ways from that which had actually run through the course of the fifth century. The first point is this. There was, when democracy was reinstated in 403, what's known as a, an agreement or indeed an oath, a religious oath of reconciliation. And the three terms of it were this, that the oligarchs, i.e. those who supported the tyrant rulers, the 30 tyrants, just got to walk out of town, go to Eleusis on the western boundaries of Attica, the territory of Attica, and they can live there, but they can't leave there. They can't be involved in Athenian politics anymore. They're over there. All exiles were to come home. So everyone who had been exiled from Athens in that one brief year period, the 30 had been exiling people that they didn't like everywhere, all of those people returned. Massive influx back into Athens. And then the most curious bit of this oath of reconciliation, no one to remember past wrongs. They were collectively deciding to, on this day to just forget what had happened, whether you'd fought for the tyrants or whether you'd fought for the democracy, when you'd turned up fighting for the democracy, what you'd done in that intervening period. If you weren't one of the key oligarchic supporters or a member of the 30 themselves, everything was forgotten. The slate was wiped clean and everyone supposedly came back together as one new democratic group. Now, how successful do you think that might have been? If you've all just been fighting one another and then you come back together and go, I'll forget it all. No one remembers a thing. Do you think people are really gonna forget what's happened and what side you've each been fighting on? I won't think so. Publicly, you had to forget, but privately you would know that your neighbor had fought on the other side, that the person down the street it's a bit iffy as to whether they were a real supporter of democracy. And if democracy had been voted out of existence and tyrants had taken power so easily, what was to stop it happening again? The, the democratic inhabitants of Athens in 403 were nervous. And that led to this. Another oath, the oath of Demophantos, which had been actually invented period earlier in about 411, 410, when Athens had had another democratic wobble, right? But it was reinstituted after 403, and the Athenians were to gather every year and swear this oath. And we're going to do that all together right now. So please, with me, you can see the words. I shall kill by word and by deed and by vote and by my own hand, if I can, anyone who overthrows the democracy at Athens, put your backs into it. You've just fought a revolution. Come on, with feeling, once more. I shall kill by word and by deed and by vote and by my own hand, if I can, anyone who overthrows the democracy at Athens. What have you done? What have you just sworn to do? If your father or your mother or your brother 
or your best friend now acts against the democracy, you have sworn by the gods that you will kill them. This oath and the democracy of Athens post 403, when I say it was changed, it was a democracy in which every citizen swore to the gods that the most important thing to each of them was the democracy above family, above friendship, above every other loyalty, the democracy mattered the most. You were all potential killers in the democracy of Athens in the fourth century BCE. You would kill for your political system. Now, alongside those changes, there were also a number of changes that tried to get Athens back on track and make it more based in the root of law, right? And to make the whole system more transparent and to us today, we would say more democratic. So for instance, they were to republish all the laws of Athens. The 30 tyrants had often been getting rid of some laws, bringing in new laws, etc. So again, they decided to take stock and republish all the laws. So everyone knew where they stood. Crucially, in the 390s, so in the decade when the play Assembly Women will be written, pay is introduced for attendance at the Democratic Assembly on the Pnic. The entirety of the fifth century, people had just been expected to give up their time freely and turn up. And many of you will have thought about the ways in which that prioritized and privileged those who had lots of money already. If you're wealthy, you can afford to go and spend a day in the assembly chatting about politics. If you're working a farm on the outskirts of Attica, that's a big loss of investment and work time for you to be part of the democracy. In the 390s, they take account of that and they say, we want everyone, whatever their economic status, to be part of this system. We're going to pay people to attend. And by the time that the assembly women is being produced, they've actually raised that pay so it's the same level as if you do jury service. Jury service and attendance at the assembly are paid. Everyone should be equal and have equal opportunity to take part in the active process of democracy. And you'll note when you see the play later on, there's quite a lot of chat around assembly pay. It was a new thing that had really only just happened in the last decade for those of you in the audience from Athens. And at the same time, they also introduced in this period what's known in Greek as the dokimasia, which is the scrutiny of anyone who held a public office. And at the end of their year of public office, they were now going to be officially scrutinized as to whether or not they had done a good job or fiddled the books. Right? So Athens, in many ways, was a very different place as Athens entered into the fourth century, it had its precious democracy back, but that meant kind of that every, every citizen was a potential killer on behalf of the democracy, who privileged the democracy above everything. In a city in which the laws were all shiny and new and republished for everyone to see, and which supposedly everyone was on an equal footing in order to take part in the political processes of debating at the assembly and serving as jury members. But do you remember what I said about no one remembered past wrongs? How true could that actually be? In 399 BCE, the same decade that Assembly Women is put on, we have the trial of this guy. Anyone want to know? Anyone know who he is? Shout it out. Socrates, yeah. You can't mis mistake those man boobs anyway. <laughs> Socrates who is put on trial for, does anyone want to tell me what he's put on trial for? Corrupting the young, that's number one. What else is he put on trial for? Not believing in the gods of the city or honoring new gods, yeah, instead. And finally, there was a third charge. Does anyone know that one? Just disobeying the laws, effectively. So honoring new gods, corrupting or subverting the young, disobeying the laws. And we've got the texts that relate to the defense and of Socrates' trial, 
and we know what happens, right? He gets condemned to death by this new Athenian democracy just four years or so post its wobble with the 30 tyrants. Now, a lot of scholars have claimed that this is not about, this case was not really about whether Socrates honoured new gods or not or corrupted the young or not because Socrates had actually been quite a tacit close ally, supporter and friend of the number of the 30 tyrants. And that while publicly, officially, no one could remember past wrongs and no one could actually go after you for having been on the side of the 30 tyrants, you could go after someone for uh, corrupting the young, honoring new gods, disobeying the law. And so many would see the case of Socrates' trial in 399 as actually how Athens managed to work through remembering the past without officially remembering the past. And Socrates was not the only victim of this process. Even the kind of main democratic rebellious leader of that revolution in 403 ends up on trial at one point um, for another set of trumped up charges. Okay. So hopefully that gives you a flavor of what the pol changing political, internal political landscape at Athens is like. But let's just think for a moment about economics as well. How had Athens funded itself during the fifth century? What did it have used to build the Parthenon and other beautiful buildings around the city? What, what uh, hands up, any ideas? The back there? Taxes, taxes on who? The empire, yeah. In fact, actually, the Athenians got off pretty scot-free, right? It was the it was the allies of the empire, the allies of the empire that provided the tribute with which buildings like the Parthenon were constructed, right? But that's all been switched off. It has no more tribute coming in. Nothing coming in to fill its coffers. Athens, in post the end of the Peloponnesian War and into the beginning of the fourth century, has to completely reinvent how it's going to fund itself. At the same period of time at which, you will remember, it's just introduced jury pay, well, sorry, assembly pay at the same rate as jury pay. Costs are going up, income is massively down. Athens will spend the next 50 years, the first half of the fourth century BCE, trying to work out how to reinvent raising money to support itself. And you're right, it will have to turn now to taxing its own citizens. And there'll be a whole series of um, internal Attican, uh, taxes across Attica. But there will also be a renewed emphasis on what we would today call self-sufficiency. But actually, in their terminology, they talked about it in terms of every oikos, every home, every household being self-sufficient. Xenophon, one of the writers of this period who wrote both historical and political texts, will, by the middle of the fourth century, write a text called the oikonomikos. The economics, is where our word comes from, of the oikos. Right? How can we take that model of self-sufficiency at the level of the individual house and actually make it work at the level of the polis and the state? And one of the things, again, you'll see time and again, coming back in this play as you see it today, is this inter interaction between the oikos and the polis how the two are confused, particularly in this play, right, and in what happens in this play. Because one of the ways in which they're thinking through the economic dilemma they're in in this period is how can we make the polis work a bit more like the self-sufficient oikos. And then finally, what about foreign policy? Right? That Peloponnesian War has ended. What then happened? What, what kind of world did Athens have to inhabit? What kind of decisions did it have to make? And we can speed through this fairly quickly, but it is incredibly confusing and should be confusing and was confusing for the Athenians themselves. So you, the Athenian members, turning up in 391, 390 BCE in the audience to watch this play, I think you should all be confused about where you stand on the wider national and international stages because so much is changing so quickly. Sparta won the Peloponnesian War. Sparta takes over, and particularly their general, Lysander, started throwing himself around the Aegean world. Right? This is what Plutarch will say about him. Lysander 
was more powerful than any other Greek before him had been and was thought to cherish a pretentious pride. He was the first Greek to whom cities erected altars and made sacrifices as a god, the first also to whom songs of triumph were sung. Suddenly you've got this man-god running around, running the Aegean. And very quickly, people start disliking it. Plutarch as well. Likening Spartans to tavern women who gave the Greeks a very pleasant sip of freedom and then dashed the wine with vinegar is wrong. Because from the very first taste, Spartan rule was harsh and bitter. Very quickly, no one's happy with Sparta running the show either. And then Sparta start doing some very odd things. In 400 BC, they send a force of soldiers against Persia. Okay. The Persian navy, by this stage, has an Athenian admiral, a guy called Conon. Hang on a sec. What does the one thing we know about the Greek world in terms of foreign policy? Greeks versus Persians. That's how it works, right? That's how it worked for the fifth century. But in the first year, the very end of the fifth century, and beginning of the fourth century, we've suddenly got Spartans going against Persians who are in fact kind of being supported by and led by Athenians. It's all gonna get very confusing. Everything you think you know about the way that international politics works is about to change. By 398 BCE, mainland Greece is at war again. We've only just finished the Peloponnesian War less than a decade before, and now we're back at war again, in which all the people who had been on the side of Sparta are now actually fighting with the Athenians against Sparta. Everyone has swapped sides, the so-called Corinthian War from 398 through to 395. It happens on two main fronts. One over kind of in the east, uh, there's a Battle of Canidos, right, in 394 BCE, in which the Athenian admiral of the Persian fleet, Conon, wins comprehensively against a Spartan navy, and Athens puts up a statue of Conon in the Agora, celebrating what an amazing guy he is. Athens is celebrating the guy who works with the Persians to beat the Spartans. And after that, the focus comes back mostly to mainland Greece. And in the same year, you have something called the Battle of Coronea. Now, Xenophon, who I mentioned, was at this battle, and this is how he described it. The earth stained with blood, friend and foe lying dead side by side, shields smashed to pieces, spears snapped in two, daggers, some on the ground, others embedded in bodies, yet some yet gripped by the hands. This was a whole bunch of city-states against Sparta. Fine, Sparta loses that battle, but then within a year, all the people who had fought against Sparta were fighting against one another. Argos wanted to take over Corinth. Corinth, who had fought against Sparta at the Battle of Coronea, but had been an ally of Sparta back in the Peloponnesian War, now joined back with Sparta again. And at the same time, Conon turns back up in Athens with Persian money to rebuild the Athenian city walls and to help anyone who wants to fight against Sparta. It is a completely confusing period of time in which from year to year, month to month, Greek city-states are changing sides and changing alliances without anyone able to actually deliver a killer blow and make it clear that they are the supreme power. In the fifth century, it had been Athens. Then at the end of the Peloponnesian War, it's obviously Sparta. But now in the 390s, who, who is the big power? Who's in charge? Who actually gets to call the shots? There was no clear answer. No one knew where they stood. And in 391, the very year of the assembly women, there is an attempt at peace, but actually a number of Greek city-states reject it. They had a chance to settle and they didn't. 
this ridiculous war, a series of wars, carries on without any clear winner. So that is the picture right, that we need to have in our heads when we come in to see Aristophanes' assembly women in that period, 391, 390. You've got a democracy that's back in place, more aggressive and assertive than ever before, and supposedly more equal, but working through memories of past wrongs in quite often nefarious and underhand ways. You've got a Athens desperately trying to reinvent itself economically and work out how to fund itself going forward, toying with the overlap of models between how an oikos, the household, works and how a polis should work. And you've got an Athens reeling from a kind of foreign policy decade in which no one's quite sure what is going on, but everyone's at war the whole time and no one can come out on top. This is the moment when Praxagora walks forward onto the stage and suggests her plan, as you will see this afternoon, that women take over. So while you're watching the play, think about those ideas that would have been at the forefront of Athenian audience members' minds. How should democracy work? How do we fund democracy? What can we take from the oikos and actually use it at the level of the polis? Are the people in charge, the men, making the right kinds of decisions, particularly in this ridiculous ongoing carousel of war after war, battle after battle? Some of you may see this play as a story of female empowerment. Others see it as a very misogynistic play in which women are made out to only have ridiculous ideas. But I think crucially, fundamentally, foremost in people's minds coming out of seeing this play, it would have been a moment to take stock of just whether people, the people, you guys, had been making the right decisions or very much the wrong decisions. And most crucially, by the end of the play, as everything starts to disintegrate in this world created by Praxagora, the world of the play and your world, the real world, meet together in disarray. Because it's you guys who have to leave the theater and decide what to do next. And the final note that I would like to leave you on is, well, this is the play obviously you're going to be seeing, and then two thoughts. Give you a little bit of an insight in what you do decide to do next. You don't do very well. Those wars continue, those battles continue, and just five years after the assembly women, the Persian king steps in in 386 BCE and mandates a peace settlement in Greece. How far have we come? How far have we fallen as Athenians for the Persian king to come and tell us what the peace terms are across Greece and in the meantime take quite a lot for himself? And the last point I want to make is that in this play, you also get to see the longest word ever created in the Greek language. And there it is. I think we've got a minute to try and say it all together. Right. Or am I going to try and say it and you're going to laugh at me? Okay, here we go. What we are saying is, limpets and saltfish and shark steak and dogfish and mullets and oddfish with savory pickle sauce and thrushes with blackbirds and various pigeons and roosters and pan roasted wagtails and larks, and nice chunks of hair marinated in mulled wine and all of it drizzled with honey and sylphium and vinegar, oil and spices. That's the easy bit. Okay. Lopa dote, makose, lako, gale, yo crani, yo leipsan, rimu, potri, matos, fili, yo carabul, melito, kata, keku, meno, kikle, pipko, su, fofa, 
Toppelister allek tru on opte falio kiklope leo lagosi rayo baffe tragano ptrugon. There we go. <laughs> Try saying that yourselves later on after a drink, non alcoholic drink or two. Ladies and gentlemen, have a wonderful day. Welcome to Warwick Classics. Enjoy yourselves.